Today we start a new series called Damaged Goods. I'm extremely excited about it, but before we get into what Damaged Good is about, I wanted to tell you a little parable. There once was a man who was blind. Day after day, he woke up early and took extra time to get ready because he knew how long his routine would take. And he carefully felt his way around the house, slowly putting on his shoes, slowly making his breakfast, slowly grabbing all of his things for work. He finds his walking stick and he heads out the door. Outside was where the real danger was. He took life slow and careful, always waiting on a pedestrian to help when he needed to cross the roads. Well, one day he heard on the radio by a man who was speaking in a very uh, powerful voice that all of our problems in life are just perceived problems. And that if we don't think about them, then they don't exist. We are the masters of our own existence. The next day, the blind man woke up. Danger is dead and I have killed him, he said. He got out of bed. And today, he didn't take the usual extra time on everything. Instead, he grabbed all of his things as quickly as he could. He stormed out the door. I'm free, he thought to himself as he ran out. He walked down the street. This day, as, you, as anybody else seeing him pass saw him, there was a definite pep in his step. And we came up to the normal intersection where he would normally wait for any pedestrian to help him. But he shouted at the top of his lungs, it's all just a game. Life is just a game. And he leaped off the curb with one foot. And as soon as his foot hit the ground, he was hit by a bus. Just because we don't think that there's a problem or we try our hardest to pretend that problems don't exist, it doesn't mean that they're not truly there. Philosophical mantras are nice to have, but they don't solve the real problem. And we'll get to the real problem in just a minute. And like I said, today we're starting this series called Damaged Goods. Um, This is a series I'm extremely excited about. But many of us at one time or another have just felt this feeling like we're just not good enough to be in the kingdom of God, right? A lot of us have felt like I'm not smart enough or we've been scared to talk to our neighbors because we feel like I just don't know enough about Jesus to be able to start talking. What if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? And so we feel like damaged goods. We feel less than. Uh, A lot of times in our lives when this happens, it's because we take our eyes off of Jesus, but that's That's not the main problem that we're going to be speaking about today. This is a three-part series that I'm extremely excited about, a journey that we all get to go on to see. If we're not damaged goods, then in the light of who God is and how he's created us and how he's redeemed us, then what are we? And in the coming weeks, we will get there. But today we're going to be talking about Peter. How Peter, uh, I love him to death because he's just a messy guy. When I read about Peter, I just feel like, oh, Kindred souls, man. Keep messing up, brother. You got it. You know? Today we're talking about Peter on a boat. So if you would, in your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We're going to be camping out there pretty much all day today. Luke chapter 5, 1 through 11. I'll read it for us. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, He was standing by the lake of Genesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little farther from the land. He sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, We toiled all night and we took nothing, but at your word, we took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to the partners in the other boats to come and help them and they came and they filled the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, depart from me. I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. 
And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and they followed him. A lot of us have felt like damaged goods at times, just like Peter. And so we need the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Jesus, our prayer um, today is that you would open up our hearts to be able to see the problem, acknowledge the problem, and then to turn our eyes to see the Savior. To know that the problem is not what defines us, it's just where we've been. But who we are in Christ is what defines us. And so Lord, this can't be done on our own. We literally cannot shift our hearts to go away from feeling like damaged goods and go toward feeling like children of God, but the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you do that in us. And so we need your help today. Lord, my prayers for all of us that we would just be real. We'd take off our masks, that we would feel the weight of our history. And we'd look forward to seeing the Savior restore us. So Lord God, please do that in us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So we're just going to walk through this section of the Bible and pull it apart and see what the Lord has for us. If you go back to verse 1, it says this, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Now that's just the Sea of Galilee. It's just a different name for it. He saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and he taught. Now, I love this, because we don't know everything that Jesus did in his life. In fact, I love that there's a song that says, if the sky was a scroll, and every stock on earth a pen, that the whole entire sky could not hold all of the beautiful things that Jesus has done. The Bible, in fact, says that we just, if everything was written down, it would fill every page of every book if we knew all the things that Jesus did. And so we walk into a story and we see that Christ has already done some amazing things. And there's people that are gathering in, trying to get close to touch Jesus. And what do we know about the presence of Jesus? There are people in the Bible who literally just touch the trail of his, the end of his robe and they're healed. So people are want, they're drawn to the power of Christ. But Christ is really, really smart. He sees all these people on land. I can't go anywhere, but there's some boats. So he goes, hey, I'm gonna go get out into this boat. So he hops in Simon Peter's boat. He goes and he teaches a lesson. Now we can just assume that he's teaching about the kingdom of God being near because that's what he had always done. But these men, these people around him, men, women, and children, I'm sure they did not expect Jesus to do what he was going to do in this story. Certainly like all the other rabbis they had seen previously, they were going to hear his teaching, probably feel good about it, maybe want to follow him. But I don't think they expected necessarily to see what happens next. Let's see how Jesus just explodes the minds of everybody standing in the area. Verse 4. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered him, master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, we'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish into their nets and their nets were breaking and they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and they filled the boats so that they began to sink. Jesus walks up to professional fishermen and he says, hey, I know that you failed in your job already. Let's try it again. Now, these guys are probably looking at Jesus like, okay, carpenter. Let the fishermen do their job, right? These guys, they fish during the nighttime and it's, it's now the morning time. And so they're washing their nets. They're getting ready. Jesus sees that they haven't caught anything. I just love that Jesus does this. Wherever he, go, he goes, there's just life and abundance and there's things happening. And in this moment, he walks up to these professionals. He says, yeah, I mean, they're, they're failures. They're probably feeling like damaged goods at that time. Like, man, we, we didn't provide for our families today. 
Jesus walks up and he sees him. He says, let's just go a little bit further out from the land. Jesus preaches the kingdom of God. He changes everything. But I love what Peter says to him. You know, Peter had obviously seen Jesus do some things, but none of these other guys say this to him. Jesus says, Master. Jesus has seen something in the life of, uh, Peter has seen something in the life of Jesus that's worth calling him Master. That's worth looking at him and going, I, I think you might be crazy, but I'm going to trust your word. You're the Master. And in this moment, Jesus shows unbelievable power over all of creation to bring about something that these men, despite all of their efforts, could never do on their own. Jesus calls forth this draft of fish and they start to dip their nets in. I'm just trying to get us into the story. They dip their nets in and all of a sudden they start to pull and they feel tug. And with all of their might, they're pooling and they're pooling and they can't get this up. So they call the other boats. They go, guys, this is crazy. Get in here. And all of them start to pull up this massive amount of fish and their nets start to tear. And they get the, the fish onto the boat, onto two boats. And it starts to sink the two boats. At that point, you just go, Jesus, stop blessing us, Please. <laughs> Jesus blesses them in abundance. They may have felt like damaged goods, but the presence of the Savior brings about this amazing amount of life. They had such a massive haul of fish, that the, the equipment that they've been using over and over and over, and they trusted their equipment. Jesus had blessed them so much that their stuff started failing. And I love how potent this, um, this miracle was for Peter. Like we said, Peter had seen other things that Jesus had done. He'd experienced other ways that Jesus had blessed people or had shown miracles. But this right here was Jesus stepping into the life of Peter saying, Peter, I want you. There's a quote by John Lang that says this. Peter had yet been able to judge no other miracle which he had seen so well as this. It belonged to his calling. It took place on his vessel with his fishing nets after his own fruitless endeavor in his immediate presence. In the case of the earlier works of the Savior, his understanding had indeed doubtless given silent acquiescence, but here both understanding and heart were constrained to bow themselves to the presence of majesty. So Peter had seen things happen. He had seen Jesus do amazing miracles, but none of these miracles were so surgeon-like precision to the life like he did for Peter. If you feel like damaged goods, I hope you know that Jesus pursues you the same way. Like if you feel like you've out God's grace, you're not good enough for God to want you, I hope you know that when God opens your eyes to his goodness, that is God pursuing you. The Bible talks about Jesus leaving the, 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 the 99 sheep to find the one or the woman who's lost the coin. She sweeps the whole house to try to find the one coin. If you feel like you have out the grace of God, I guarantee you this, Jesus looks for you ferociously. And the good news is the things that Jesus looks for, he finds. So wherever you are, if you feel like God has, has passed you by, I guarantee you he has not. He loves damaged goods. Let's keep moving on in the story. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon Peter. I love Peter's response here. He sees this miracle that Jesus is doing and his response is just so honest. Jesus, you're just apart from me. You're too good. You're too powerful. I'm, I'm afraid. Peter's probably looking into his past, thinking about all he's done, going, I don't deserve to be in the presence of this great master. 
how many of us sometimes feel at a church gathering like we don't deserve to be in the presence of all these holy people? News for you. Everybody in here has a problem with sin. Everybody in here needs the grace of God every single day. Every single person in here is dependent on the movement of the Holy Spirit to put the, to death the things of our flesh. So if you're in here and you feel alone, you're not alone. We all together as the body of Christ get to walk towards the kingdom of God going, Jesus is my righteousness. I do not need a righteousness of my own. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't need to muster anything on my own. So if you're in here and you feel like you don't have what it takes, neither do I. You don't need to have what it takes. You need Jesus. To Peter, falls down at Jesus' feet saying, depart from me. Peter felt like damaged goods, unwanted, unable to be used, unlovable and irredeemable. But God has always had special plans, special love for the broken. That is, that's who he chooses to lead his people. And you know why? Because like we just said, there's no such thing as someone who's not broken, Right? We all live in a fallen world, but God can transform broken people into beautiful new creations. But we must first remember that we are dealing with a very real problem, and this very real problem has always existed. You know, God can justify the most deplorable of failures, even Bible heroes. I, I think it's so funny that we read the Bible and we think of it as just this like, um, the, let me insight. The Bible is a rated R book, okay? The Bible is filled with people who are just scoundrels, okay? And God redeems these people. So I kind of wanted to walk through some of history because the Old Testament, you know, a lot of us only read the New Testament, but the Old Testament is still our history. So where did it all begin? How did this all go wrong? Well, one day, a long, 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 long time ago, there was this guy named Adam. Now, Adam lived in the garden with God. Everything was perfect. He had perfect relationship with God. There was no rift between the two. It says he walked with God in the cool of the day. That'd be beautiful. Uh, this, just this past week has been very nice weather. Um, I've been sick, but I still, I love laying out in my hammock in my yard. I would love to do that with God. <laughs> like, how cool is that, that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day? Well, the story goes on, Adam gets a wife and uh, they get deceived by Satan and they sin against God. And everything at that point is broken. Literally, all of the cosmos is changed. Like if you think of the farthest, farthest, farthest reaching star out at the very edges of the universe, that star was changed and started to groan for the redemption of all things. The cosmos was changed we were changed when the fall happened. Everything now at that point was broken. There began to be a rift between God and man. And Adam and Eve, they tried to hide themselves away from God and they hid themselves with leaves because they were ashamed. They felt guilty. And God finds them and he says, those, those aren't gonna be enough. I'm gonna clothe you. I'm gonna clothe you. And throughout the Bible, we get stories of this where man, mankind acts like damaged goods and defiles what God calls beautiful and God comes in the way that he does and brings grace and he brings mercy. Let's keep going. How about Abraham? Man, we think back to Abraham, we're like, Abraham, you know, God promised him blessing and land and that his, uh, his offspring were gonna bless all people. We think of Abraham as this great leader, and he was, but he also had problems because when he encountered another king and he was scared that he was gonna die, he trafficked off his wife. He said, hey, just tell him you're my sister, which is a half-truth. It's also creepy, but, you know, he tells him, tell him you're my sister. And so he, he does that. He, he says, just to keep us alive, like you go over there so I can be safe. A second time, he does the same exact thing. The father of our faith is a human trafficker, right? Then his son gets born and his son does the exact same thing. That's generational sin happening. 
And then his son is born. And he's the most deceptive man that I could think of, Jacob, right? You have to be a certain type of lunatic when you put goat skin on your hand and try to trick your old dad, right? The guy was, the guy was despicable. And yet God uses the people who are despicable because in our weakness, God is made all the more strong. Our history is a history of people who are broken and have problems. Or how about Noah, right? I know a guy. This guy saw all of the earth practically destroyed, right? I mean, a flood came, flooded the earth and killed all of humanity despite other than this one small remnant of people. And for some reason, we teach this to our kids with fell boards like, and everybody died. It's crazy. Christians, get it together. But Noah sees the just wrath of God, right? He sees the just wrath of God on a very sinful people in a crazy act of grace, a crazy act of kindness. God keeps a remnant. Noah sees all this happen, and a little bit later, he gets hammered drunk. I mean, just plastered beyond belief, right? His son walks in and sees him naked, walks away and makes fun of his dad to his brothers. And then Noah wakes up and he he starts to curse that son. Which, you know, I don't know everything that went on in that, but still, I mean, if you just saw the just wrath of God destroy the entire planet and, and in the very gracious act keep you alive, why would you get so drunk that you black out completely? This is our history. People with problems, people with brokenness, or Moses. Moses was an angry dude. He's brought into Pharaoh's house in a very miraculous way. And then he, he starts to learn about his people and he sees an Egyptian killing one of his people, or I'm not, beating one of his people. So Moses goes up and he kills the guy. And he hides and he's scared. And he runs away because they start to find out who it is. I mean, you could, could you imagine? I think he's uh, 40 years from, he was 40 years old when this happened. And he's running for 40 years, feeling like damaged goods, feeling like this God of the Israelites, my people, I don't know if, I, if, if he'll love me because I've murdered, I've killed. And 40 years later, God sees him in a, in a burning bush. And God says, you're going to get my people out of Egypt. And fast forward a little bit further in his life, he gets furious again and strikes a rock. Amazingly, water flows out of this rock. Super cool. But Moses had anger problems. God uses the broken, the angry, the sinful, and he redeems them for his good purposes. Or David and Bathsheba. David, the great king, the golden age of Jewish history. David finds some girl bathing and essentially, you know, she she can't say that she doesn't want to go meet him. So he has this girl come over, essentially rapes her, and then has her husband killed out on the battle line. That's a man after God's own heart. And what I don't want you to do is to hear this and go, oh, well then, well, Christianity's all garbage. No, 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 no. What you have to do at that point is look on the inside and go, okay, where have I been angry and murdered people in my own hearts? Where have I been lustful? And if I were the king and I had nobody to hold me accountable, what would I do? David's no different from you. This is our history. There really is a problem. Let's get into some of the New Testament. How about John Mark, okay? John Mark went out. He was like, I want to be a missionary with you, Paul, Paul and Barney. Let's go. So they go out to missions, um, strutting their stuff like this. Once they get out onto the mission field, John Mark goes, I'm sorry, too much for me, I'm out. He abandons them where they're at. And this puts a deep rift between, John, or between Paul and Barnabas. This guy abandoned his post. He abandoned the calling that God had for him. And you know what? When you read your Bible and you read the gospel of Mark, guess who you're reading? God can use the most deplorable people. He can use the ones who have abandoned everything and still redeem them. Let's jump back in 
to Peter's life. Before we do that, though, you might be asking yourself at this point, John, why are we focusing so much on the bad? Well, when I was in high school, uh, I played lacrosse. Me and John played lacrosse. On Thursdays, we would have game footage day. We would watch game footage, and like 10% of the time, you were happy because you were like, look at that goal I just scored, guys, huh? The rest of the time, everybody was like, how could you do that, you idiot? And I'm like, oh my God. We would get so angry at each other for the simplest of mistakes that in the moment, your brain is moving way too fast and you can't tell what's going on. But we look at those things so that we could see. If we know the mistakes we made, we can see how to fix them next time. If we can see the way that we were beat before, we can know how to defend against it. So sometimes in the Christian life, it's good to start at a place where we look at the brokenness in order to see more of the glory and the beauty of who God is and how he is continually redeeming us. That's why we're focusing on what we're focusing on. But let's get back to the life of Peter. Seriously, when I look at the life of Peter, I think to myself like, okay, if this guy can be saved, I can be saved. And when I look at you all, I go, if I can be saved, I seriously believe God can do amazing things in your life because I've done some pretty rotten things and God's still been good to me. But I love that Peter is in the Bible. And as I was preparing for this sermon, I was reading this next section of text and I wept. I was in my office. I was like, I hope nobody comes in covering my face. Let's read it. This is Luke 22, 54, uh, 54 through 62. It says, when they had seized him, they led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and he sat down together. Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, looked closely at him and said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I don't know him. And after an interval, interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man was also with them, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and he wept bitterly. When I'm reading this story in my office this week, I'm crying, going, Peter, Peter, don't, man, don't do it. Don't deny Jesus again. And as I, as I put myself into the story, I believe that the Lord looked at Peter in that moment with compassion in his eyes. I, I, I believe that because later Jesus would come back to Peter after he had died and resurrected and he comes back to Peter and I know that in Peter's mind he was probably struggling with all the shame of his past decisions and Jesus says Peter do you love me Peter do you love me Peter do you love me and Peter says yes Lord you know I love you and Jesus says feed my sheep in Peter's darkest hour Jesus had compassion. And as Peter was wrestling with these things, Jesus comes back and redeems the whole situation. He says, Peter, on this rock, I'm gonna build my church. So this wasn't the end of the story for Peter. And if you feel, listen, every time you have chosen anything besides Jesus, any sinful deed besides Jesus, that is you denying Christ, okay? So you can, when I cry at this stuff, it's because I look into the life of Peter and I go, there I am. There I am right there. I can remember when I denied Christ. For me in my past, I can remember when I drank way too much. I can remember when I harbored bitterness towards somebody who abused me for 20 plus years. 
And that bitterness, that brokenness makes me feel like damaged goods. But I've got to remember that God has so much more for my story and so much more for your story because your story is not finished. This is the redemption that Jesus has. But let's go back to to Luke 5 and let's see the redemption that Jesus has in the life of Peter through his calling. Verse 10 says this. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. Let me read that again. Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and they followed him. We've been talking all day about the fact that there is a problem. And I, I want you to see this, that there's a solution. It's a savior. Peter in that moment needed a savior when he said, Lord, depart from me. I'm too sinful. The savior, right when Peter thought he would depart and turn away, certainly did the savior turn in. We have a savior and his name is Jesus Christ. This is such good news. So Jesus says to Peter, I'm gonna make you a fisher of men. Well, Peter goes throughout his life and he makes a lot more mistakes, just like all of us do, uh, to the point where Jesus calls Peter Satan. That's gotta feel pretty bad. But we go through Peter's life, probably all along the way, Peter's remembering, man, Jesus said I was gonna be a fisher of men. What did that mean? What did that mean? What did that mean? And Jesus dies and he resurrects. And all of a sudden Jesus says, I'm gonna send you a helper. And this helper comes and he fills them. He's called the Holy Spirit. And one day Peter gets up in front of a mass of people, a multitude of people. And with power, the power of the Holy Spirit, the confidence and the peace that only comes with knowing Jesus Christ, Peter preaches the gospel and 3,000 souls that day are saved. When Jesus promised Peter he would make him a fisher of men, we get a look in the future and see the gospel net go out and watch Peter pull in all of these souls. In your life, doesn't matter how old you are, how much you've messed up, how many bad things have been done to you, If God says he has a plan for you, God will see it to completion. So you're not damaged goods. For all of us in here, I mean, let's talk about all of the people that we've talked about so far. I mean, they would have been damaged goods if it were not for the intercession of God on their behalf. Well, if you're a Christian, you have the intercession of God by by Jesus Christ, and you have the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life, there is no such thing as damaged goods in the arms of an almighty Savior. 